This morning, I want to look at the book of Job. Last Sunday, I mentioned to you that, that I would be speaking to you today about Job. This has been a summer that has been very difficult for many in our family, and we, in our church family, and, and we, we, we know that, and there's been some hurts and pains. And so I, I mentioned to you last Sunday that I want to talk about Job. And so, you know, there's lots of scriptures, 20 of them in chapter 1 of Job, but I, I want to read it with you. And would you stand with me as we read Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. You can follow along on the, on the screen, or if you have your Bible or electronic device, you can read it as, as we read it. It's really hard to take in. There's so much. In the land of Oz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless. He was upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a, a period of fasting and had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, well, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. Then the Lord answered, or said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless, upright, a man who fears God, shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one that has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the eldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in it and the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And God, I, I do pray today that through this word that is very, very it's difficult for us to read. Difficult to understand, but God, by your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us with clarity, and God, may we leave transformed by what your Spirit will say to the church today. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we often find ourselves going to our internet, our emails, and we can just block what we don't like and press delete. And sometimes, we probably, and I at times, would like to just go in there and say, here's the book of Job, let me block it and press delete. Why is this book in the Bible? 
For centuries, people have been trying to wrap their minds around the book of Job. Theologians have wrestled with it. Now, the, the, what I've read in the commentaries, they, everyone says it's, it's hard to understand. It's difficult. So theologians, they wrestle with this. Scholars have dissected it. Students have debated it. And as pastors, when I began in ministry, we were called to preach the whole counsel of God, not just to pick isolated passages, not just to pick out things that tickle us and make us feel good, but we were challenged in Bible college, preach the whole counsel of God. But this is a difficult one to preach. This is a very difficult one for any pastor to, to try and get his mind around. A lot of us would just like to pass over it. The book of Job is tough. It's tough. I mean, the prosperity camp don't like it. The bless me camp despise it. The God always tickles in me. It makes me feel good camp. They close their eyes to it. The people who see salvation as a get out of trouble card, they jump over it. The people who believe that sickness and disease is because of sins committed, they struggle with it. And the people who believe that it's always God's will to instantly heal, they fight against this. And the people who feel that God does not allow bad things to happen to good people, they just can't handle this. So it is a difficult, it's a rough, rough book to make your way through. I mean, have you ever been to a conference on Job? I've never seen one advertised and never been to one. But let's see what the ad could look like. The ad could say, oh, the wild pain of suffering. Join us. Or how about rejoice when you just lost it all? That's a good slogan, a good line to catch your attention. How about this one? Adventure yourself when you're hurt so bad you just want to die. That's a good one. Now, I got the best one that I've heard a long time ago. And the winner is, drum roll. And the winner is, not you. You know, that's an ad for people that pay the, play the lottery. It's discouraging people from just spending all their money on lottery tickets. And their winner is not you. Well, that's a good line. Let's go to that kind of a conference. Join the thousands who will gather. Not. I tell you, you could hold that conference in a telephone booth. You could hold that Conference in an outhouse. I'll take, a, I'll take a telephone booth over an outhouse. You just wouldn't have a lot of people attending it. It's not a crowd pleaser. The book of Job is not that appealing to any one of us. My own flesh says, stay away from it. Avoid it. That'd be much easier, come to think of it. There's other scriptures in the Bible other parts of the Bible that if deleted would make my preaching a whole lot easier and so much more pleasing. And it would, if we could always just speak a word that tickles and tickles and tickles, but it's in the Bible. So let's tackle what does not tickle. So as I consider Job, there are two words that just kind of came up to me. It seems. Number one, it seems to raise a question about God. If we're honest, we have wrestled with this. Let's face it, let's be honest. It seems to raise a question about God. How could a loving God allow a good man to suffer so much? We've all asked it. See, a loving God and a suffering man does not seem to belong on the same page. In our minds, they should be separate. C.S. Lewis said, it's in your notes, the problem of pain is atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith. The problem of pain. I've seen a lot of people in pain over the years in hospitals. The atheistic camp just throw it at us. Where's God now? Where's your God of love now? If God were real, if God was love, he would not allow this. 
And then there's others that, that say either God is not a God of love and so is not moved by human, under, human suffering, or he is not a God of power and therefore is helpless to do anything about it. There's lots of camps out there, lots of people thinking about this. And I want to say that atheism is not the answer, but in some form. I don't care how deep you rooted you are in your faith, how long you served God, how much you pray, how, how many, if you know the Bible from cover to cover and you can recite it, you wrestle with this question, how could God do this? We find ourselves at some point in our lives making a fist and raising it up before God to the heavens and crying out, how could you, God? Haven't you done that? Why did you allow this to happen? You said you loved me, but I don't see love in action. And you say, I can't line this up with God is love. And what you're going through and the, the wrestlings you go through and the turmoil and the pain, yeah, I can't line this up with God is love. I can't line this up with God so loved the world. I don't feel loved by him. I can't line this up with how I've lived for you and served you, and this is what I get in return. I've read many testimonies from people who said life was going on, life was red and rosy, and life was wonderful, and we're serving God and, and loving God and doing all these marvelous things. Life was great when wham, it all changed. I read the testimonies. You might be here this morning and you say, I am the testimony, you might say. See, life's pain and suffering, it really, it really does mess with our theology. It really does. See, the pains, of, the pains of life really messed with David's theology of God. Now, now, David used words like forsaken. David used words like forget me forever. David used words like hiding your face. He said, sorrow in my heart. He said, wrestling with my thoughts. He said, enemy, the enemy's triumphing over me. He said a word like ravaged. He said, I am sleeping in death. And that's just in Psalm 13. There's lots more in the Psalms where you read the beginning of the psalm and you discover what David's going through and he's wrestling with his theology about God. It's wonderful that it's turned around kind of by the, by the end of the psalm, but David is telling us, I've been there. I know what it's like to wrestle with questions. I know what it's like to cry out to God, why, 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 why? During the difficult and painful season. It really messes with our theology. And all of us have written our own psalms from time to time. Out of great pain has come psalms. And so number one, it seems, as I read this account, that to raise a question about God. Number two, it seems so unfair to Job. Don't we read that and say, this is just unfair for this man? He was not just any man, but this man was upright. This man was faithful. This man was good. In fact, God said in Job 1 and verse 8, there is no one on earth like Job. When I read that again, this past Monday was my sermon prep day. So when I read that, I said, how many people then were living on earth? Boy, that was a struggle. Man, when you start chasing that through to try to figure out how many and all these charts and stuff, well, the, the best estimate that I can come up with, what I've discovered, is 25 million people. So out of 25, approximately 25 million people living on earth at that time, Job, he surpassed them all. And God said there's no one on earth like him. No one. He feared God. He pushed evil away from him. He could not be pinned with blame. And so we ask ourselves, was this guy even normal? Job. He had a perfect record. 
He sought holiness, not sinfulness. He was a model to hold up. He was a man to be copied and admired. In fact, I got to tell you this. Abe Martins is a pillar of the church. A little side note here. Pillar of the church and lying in his bed, waiting to go home to glory. And, and I, I go and visit him. One time he said to me, I'll see you in the rapture. Ready to go, wants to go. When I visited him last week, I said, Abe, I'll tell you, it'll make you weep. It'll make you weep. I said, Abe, when you know how close he is to God, preparing himself to go into eternity, that blessed hope. I just quote him scripture. But I said to him, Abe, you're a pillar in the church. I said, Abe, thank you for being such a man of character, such a man of integrity, such a man of honesty, such an upright man. And I just went on just to butter him up good because it's true. You know what he said to me? I had to reach down close to his mouth because he's so weak. And he said, don't put it on so thick. Don't put it on so thick. Oh, Abe. And so we look at Job and we say, here was the man that, that was faithful and all the good things, and we read about it, and so we say it seems so unfair. He was God's dream believer. All was well. And then it was as if, in Job's case, it was as if God and Satan climb opposite grandstands and Job suddenly finds himself on the field with the spotlight on him. Satan sneered and he threw out the jabs and God says, Aha, uh -huh, there's nobody on the face of the earth like Job. Anywhere, no one like him. So the conversations continued until God, God decided to remove the protective hedge around Job and everything he had. Suddenly, Job's world caved in. How bad did it cave in? Let me just tell you. He lost everything. What did he lose? 500 yoke of oxen. He lost 500 donkeys. He lost 7,000 sheep. He lost 3,000 camels. Nearly all of his servants died. His seven sons and three daughters were killed in a tornado. Painful sores broke out all over his entire body. His wife turned on him. His friends were a little help, and you thought you had it bad. He lost it all. And Job did whatever, what any person would do, what you and I would do. Why, God? He tried to find the answers. Inwardly, outwardly, he screamed, I'm sure, at the sky, and I'm sure he just wanted to die. Of course he did. He wrestled with theology. He wrestled with philosophy with his friends, which was tedious and depressing. It seemed so unfair. No one in the entire Bible, except for Jesus, suffered more than Job did. I got a third point that will hopefully tie this together. It seems, it seems to me that God included Job in the Bible for a purpose. That there's a reason why Job is in there. See, it's in this book of Job that, that God pulls back the curtain and he allows us to see what's really going on behind the scenes. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't know. So we get to see the big picture. Yes, there is a battle for your life. Yes, there are tough and rough times for all of us. Yes, there are trials and tribulations and temptations. Yes, there's pain and losses in life. Yes, there is disease and there is suffering. Yes, there is testings and there's inspections. Yes, there are situations that arise 
that which will force you and I to pick sides and choose our loyalties. Who are you going to serve? Life is a test. Life is a challenge. You're on the field. Jesus was tested in the wilderness. He squared off against the plans and the tricks and schemes of the enemy. He defeated the enemy with the very word of God. He was weak in his body, but he used the word of God. He spoke the word of God. He defeated the enemy with the very word of God. He quoted scripture to the enemy, and I'm sure he quoted that to himself. This is what the word of God says. This is what the Bible says. This is what God says. He defeated him. Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, he said, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. Don't you think that Satan desires to sift you as wheat? All of us, he doesn't like the faithful. He doesn't like the believer. He doesn't like you calling upon God. He doesn't like you serving him. He doesn't like you loving him. He doesn't like you doing ministry. He doesn't like it one bit. Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But Jesus told Peter, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, may sift you as wheat. Here's the quote that I found last week. Can I read it to you? Grain was agitated or shaken in a kind of a fan or sieve. The grain remained in the fan and the chaff and the dust were thrown off so Christ says that Satan desired to try peace, Peter to place trials and temptations before him to agitate him, to see whether anything of faith would remain or whether all would be found to be chafed in false professions. Agitation comes to all of us. What's going to remain? What's going to remain? And so Job, he had a choice. He had a choice. Will I bail or will I stay? Will I defect or will I remain? Will I leave or cleave? Will I let go or hang on? Paul the apostle faces challenges too. In fact, God promised him at the very beginning of ministry, very beginning, he said, I was going to show him the great things he must suffer for me. whoopee de do. Count me in. Sounds like a joyous, joyous ride. Right off the bat, he told Paul, you might as well know up front, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be pain. You might as well know at the beginning of your Christian walk, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not going to be all red and rose. It's not going to be like, a, you know, what they always say, tiptoeing through the rose. There are thorns in there. There are challenges in there. Congratulations. You're going to face some hard times. Suffer. Paul did. Forsake God, he did not. While in jail suffering, he wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 12. I just love this passage. He said, I hold on to him who is holding on to me. What's he saying? The hand that is reaching down from the heavens. When he grabs a hold of my hand and squeezes it, I squeeze his hand back. I lay hold of him who is holding on to me. And so when you're facing your battles and facing your challenges and facing your pains and facing your questions, hold on to him who's holding on to you. Don't let him go. I press toward, Paul says, I press towards the prize. I press towards the finish line. I run, I run, I run, I run, I run with all I'm worth because I'm in the Summer Olympics and I'm in there to win for the glory of God. That was Paul. That was Paul. At the end of his life, a young upcoming preacher, Timothy, and he says, I, because I fought well, I can die well. He said, because I ran well, he said, I can finish well. Because I kept the faith, I can die in the faith. He also said to this young Preacher, he said, keep your head in all situations. He said, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Yes, sir. I will. That was his challenge. 
to a young man growing up in ministry. Keep your hands. Wow. Of course your life is like a contest. All of our lives are. See, Satan wants to eternally destroy you. And God wants to eternally save you. So, which world are you living for? Are you living for this world or the next? Well, you know, let me sh show you an illustration here. What world are you living for? This rope never ends. It goes right down through there in Pastor Ren's office, and it circles the entire globe. How many believe that? I just lied. It goes into Pastor Ren's office, and it's tied on a doorknob, and it comes down under the door, out where I'm at. On the end of this rope is a green space. This is earth. This is where you and I are right now, right here. That's where we live. I don't know where you're living. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what difficulties there may be. But this is where you and I reside. We're born. We work through some things, and we kind of dance around in here. You know, we wrestle with things. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Do you think this is the end? Can I remind you where this rope goes? This is the green space. This is all of eternity. It never ends. It never ends. Isn't that a fascinating thought? So we're, what are you living for? Do you, are you just living for this little green? If you are, you're going to be disappointed. You know, I was taught as a young boy growing up in Truro, Nova Scotia, this world is not my final home. I am just passing through. I'm kind of like Abraham. We're all the same. Don't ever forget it. The green space, but all of eternity. And in this green space, we sacrifice and give up so much. In this green space, things that challenge us and mess with our theology and mess with our thoughts about God, sometimes we lose out here and we will miss eternity with Jesus forever. Wow. See, if you're in the faith, just for the frills, if you're in the faith, you began this journey with God for the frills that you can get and take from God, you'll be a Christmas Christian and you'll be a birthday believer. That means you'll be happy as long as the presents keep flowing. If that's for me, I'm busy right now. I'm kind of tied up. But I want to be an all Season saint. How many want to be an all-season saint? It doesn't matter how high the water is. doesn't matter how low it is. doesn't matter how deep the pain is. doesn't matter if I'm whistling Dixie or I can't even whistle a tune. It hurts so bad. It doesn't matter. Picture this rope. The green space. Don't let all of eternity... Be wasted and lost because you're living for just this world. The green space. You've got to be thinking of the heaven space. The eternity space. The place where Abe Martins is getting ready to go right now. Count me in for the long haul. Romans 8 and 28, I know I have to stop. Romans 8 and 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good. Someone said to me one time, I've never forgot it, because you're a believer, when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, from that point on, nothing will ever work against you for the rest of your life. But he says, everything, everything works together for your good. To them that love God and are called according to his purposes. He loves you. You love him. He works everything together. He'll carry you through. He'll walk you through. He'll get you through your problems, He'll get you through your trials. Count me in for the long haul. Um, 
Well, I've got to read this. And this Job. Let's go back to Job. Now, we know that in those wrestling times, we all learn something, and Job learned something, and, and I, I don't have time to expand on it, but I just want to read it. Go, back, go to the end. We're going to go to the end of, of Job. Job chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. He said, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. And, and, you know, Job had his issues in working through this, but he said at the end, no purpose of yours will be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. I said things I shouldn't have said. Job says, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. And God was saying that to Job. Job said, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Is that powerful or what? My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust, dust and ashes. If you look at Psalm 42, 12 to 17, you said, the, just look at this, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life. It's just not over yet, folks. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former. He had 4, 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named, what is that? That name is there. And the second one was Keziah, and the third one, I know you want me to read those and stumble over them, but I'm not. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to fourth generation, and so Job died an old man and full of years. End of story. Isn't it marvelous? But even if Job's life didn't end this way, he still was a winner. I'm just saying today, don't live for the green space. Live for eternity. And whatever you have to go through, God will carry you through. Whatever you have to endure, God will be with you. You're not the only one in the furnace. There's someone else in there with you. Let's stand as the worship team comes. This morning, if you're here and you need someone to pray for you, or lift you up before our Heavenly Father, then we want to take that moment. If you're hurting, you're struggling, we want to take a moment and come alongside of you. Even if you say, I just can't even pray, I'm so hurting. Let us pray for you. Let us, let us gather beside you and, and and pray that God would be with you and God would help you. And I pray that you never forget this illustration. Illustrations have a way of sticking in our minds. Live for eternity, not just the green space. So as we sing a concluding song, if you need someone to pray for you, just step out. Come down the front prayer teams. I want you to be ready right away to come up and begin to pray for those that need prayer today. In his name. the most marvelous invitation you give to us so inviting you said come as you are we can just come before you just the way we are we don't have to pretend to be somebody else 
We don't have to get it right first and then come to God. We come to you just the way we are. And you begin to impart into us all that we need to be victorious. Thank you, God, for the family that we can pray one for another that we'd be healed. Thank you for the family that supports, that cares, that loves. Thank you, Jesus. I pray, God, that as we go our ways this week, that we would go knowing that Jesus truly does love us. May we never question that. May we never allow circumstances in life to rob us of our eternity in heaven. That is the hope, our blessed hope. May we never allow the enemy to rob us of our incredible eternal life with you. In his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.